go. Go ahead. Hey, <laughs> we're working in. now, honey. Welcome in, everyone, to Redacted on this Tuesday. I'm Clayton Morris. I'm Natalie Morris. And uh, this is a show where we cover the stories the mainstream media largely ignores. We're going to cover a bunch of big stories tonight on the show. The fact that Israel is bombing embassies now with a sole purpose in order to drag the United States specifically into war with Iran. That's the way to do it, is to agitate, to bomb in Rafah, but also bomb Hezbollah and also target in Syria. Will the, United, will the Biden administration take the bait? We're going to talk about that tonight. Plus, the city of Denver is begging immigrants to, hey, we don't have anything for you. Go to another liberal city and go and implode them. We, we can't take it. Uh, that video leaked. We're going to ask J.J. Carroll, who was a Borders and Customs Patrol, what he thinks of that. He was an agent who once had the job of securing the borders and has a big opinion about why the borders are no longer secure. And why sanctuary cities are a total crap hole right now and collapsing. So JJ will be joining us uh, in moments. And also Laura Logan is going to be joining us here tonight as we look at an update on the bridge collapse and the cyber attack with a major update from Laura uh, and her reporting with the intelligence community. Are more cyber attacks coming to U.S. infrastructure? Uh, we're going to talk about that on the show. But good to see all of you guys. Let us know where you're joining us from. I saw Sylvia here in the chat just a moment ago said, I am glad we don't have that old countdown anymore. So Sylvia is all in. She said, I like the uh, I like the new show. Oh, and uh, Cri you. Crypto Bambi says, finally caught Redacted live. Let us know if this is your first time joining us live. We are live on this, uh, what is it, Tuesday night, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Good to see you. Oh, we have a, a viewer I think, from I, think I, might, I might be the only person, the only person that still misses the countdown timer because I'm still sitting here at, at 30 minutes prior to the show setting things up and I have nothing to know what time it is or what to like I, I just sit oh. here can like, you run yeah. it for yourself maybe you just no run it for yourself philip and you, and I, like, maybe <laughs> you know what that's genius that's genius I, i'm gonna create <laughs> a youtube channel that is just the i'll create a youtube channel that's just the countdown timer that's just for us people that want to see yeah. the countdown timer and then there we'll you go back. Really? all right sounds good and just run it as its own youtube yeah. show like separately on the show <laughs> uh simply yeah, yeah, exactly. here simply here in our chat says ukraine has now lowered their draft age yes they did this today yeah. you're right and they said redacted was right yeah Ooh, we were, do we get an i told you so we were saying this a couple of weeks ago that this was going to happen yeah Zelensky this afternoon officially uh some, i don't know passed his own law because you know they canceled elections so they don't really have a parliament anymore he gets to do what he wants so now the draft age is now down to 25 years old so any sort of younger ukrainians that were left we're going to be, you know, are going to be killed. We saw a bus full of younger Ukrainians on their way to the front line. So now you've, you've killed an entire older generation. Now you're going to kill all of the younger uh, generation of Ukrainians. That's uh, Zelensky's goal in Ukraine. So, Did they yeah. poll the population to see how popular that one would be? Doubt it, right? I, I, something <laughs> tells me something tells me they're not doing polls in uh, in Ukraine anymore. You, you know, you don't have you don't have media. You don't have any opposition media. Mm hmm. You don't have elections, right? So you don't have freedom of religion. No, you don't have you freedom don't have of freedom religion. Freedom of language, it's but they are as Kam as Kamala reminds us, though. This is a democracy. Ukraine is a democracy. It's basically they're building what they would love to have in the U.S. over there. They're like, oh, well, we can't do it here, but we can do it over there. It's so, a test bed. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, all right. Well, we got a lot of news to get to, so let's do it, shall we? All right. So we're bombing embassies now. That is the state of the world. Are we going to stand for it? While most of the media is horrified that Israel bombed clearly marked aid vehicles in Gaza, killing international aid workers, we are too. And we are equally horrified about the bombing of a consulate and the violations of international law that could spell out war for everyone. That's you and me, folks. Here's the Telegraph today trying to get your attention to the death of this man in Gaza because he doesn't look like the normal Middle Eastern person we are used to seeing as victims. He looks like Hamas. In Gaza. Uh, no, he does not. Hmm. Uh, I don't think, I mean, okay, I don't want to make prejudice about what nationality people are. Are, but he was in clearly marked vehicles for an organization that was there to provide food aid to the starving m people in Gaza from World Kitchen Central. Uh, here's video of that vehicle, which was struck by bombs. You can tell it was marked. There is no way to think, oh, is that Hamas? Is that a terrorist organization? No, that's aid. Well, Netanyahu this afternoon said it was a total accident. Total accident. Yes. Uh, here's exactly what the IDF says, that it they are carrying out an in-depth examination at the highest levels 
to understand the circumstances of this tragic incident. So do you need an in-depth investigation to know that the bombing in Gaza is indiscriminate and that it's killing more civilians than actual targets? I don't think you need it. There's your conclusion. That's what's happening. I just said it. Oh, and it, it. Like they said that they, oh, they saw a weapon. That was their excuse. But the thing is, like, let's say they did say, say, see a weapon. Does it justify, like, for one potential terrorist to take out, you know, that many innocent civilians? Well, that is their calculation. Yes, the that is the ratio. Well, yeah, that's yeah. That's what hang they on. Say. So, so they're, they're they're saying that that it was unintentional. Like this was unintentional, and he had a gun. Am I the only one that sees the problem there? <laughs> right. yeah. Great, great point. Yeah, exactly. As Barb in the chat says, IDF knew exactly what they were doing. I mean, let let us know in the chat room right now. Does anyone believe they didn't know what they were doing, targeting these aid trucks? I mean, come on. We know exactly what they're doing. I mean, but anyway, I'd be curious. Let us know in the chat if you think that uh, Netanyahu is... Well, they know that they don't know what they're doing. That's my take on it. They know that they're bombing indiscriminately. Right. That's that's the... It's. I don't think it was an intentional targeting of an aid vehicle. Could have been. But I think that they're just spreading bombs out, you know, kind of like well, that, you, you spray... I mean, I, it, that was a pretty precise it, 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 hit on the roof of that vehicle. You yeah. Have, like they had yeah, to and, really, and, like it was right on top. Yeah. And, Someone and, in our and chat. the fact that they're, they're attempting, sorry, they're attempting to, to siege Gaza, you don't want food going in. The right. idea of a siege is to starve the population out. And so to me, it seems very intentional because that's what you would want to do in a siege. Okay. Let us know in the chat what you think. Was it targeting the aid or is it incompetence because of too many bombs? Um, you know, we're free to have our opinion here. Yeah. What? Are you going to say something? No, I'm oh, listening okay. to you. Um, so, yes, Israel is acting on mea culpa about this. Like, whoops, my bad. We really didn't mean to. We'll find out what happens. They are not acting this way about the bombing of the Iranian consulate in Damascus, Syria, on Monday. Watch this footage. Okay, so Israel told CNN that it would not comment on this, but they are saying we thought it was a military target or we still think it is. Here's the quote in CNN. They're saying we won't comment. However, a military spokesperson says Israel believes the target struck was a military building of Quds forces, which is still a unit of the Iranian uh, foreign operations. Here's what another spokesperson said. According to our intelligence, this is no consulate and this is no embassy. I repeat, this is no consulate and this is no embassy. This is a military building of Quds forces designed, disguised as a civilian bu building in Damascus. Uh, but four unnamed Israeli officials acknowledged that Israel did carry out, at the, out the attack, according to the New York Times. Now, reports are that the building was connected to the embassy. So let's take a closer look at a still image. You can see the embassy there on the left. And what they're saying is that the connecting building was where the ambassador lives, although he wasn't there at the time, thankfully. But seven other people were and got uh, got killed. I'm sorry, it might be five. Um, I think I'm... I'm Mixing up the attacks here. Uh, having never been there, none of us can say if it is part of the embassy or not, but it sure seems like it is. And even CNN is saying that this is, quote, the most dangerous escalation outside of Gaza since the start of the Hamas-Israel war nearly six months ago. You think? Yeah. And I spoke to Colonel McGregor just a short time ago who says, I mean, this is the bait right now. Will the Biden administration fall for this? This is, in fact, in many ways, suicide for Israel to carry this out. And will the United States be dragged into this war? This is exactly what Israel wants, is to be dragged into this war. It's for the United, United States. States to be dragged in. Yeah, I'm going to remind you how Kavor Kalmasian said that just yesterday on our show in just a minute. But first, let's remind ourselves how big of a deal is to attack an embassy. 
Consulates and their staff have protection under the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Crimes Against Internationally Protected Persons. This was a decree that was signed in 1973. Here it is, according to the United Nations, an attack on an embassy is an attack on the nation itself, which means that we can say that Israel now is bombing Iran directly. Uh, they bomb Syria all the time. That's not new. But a direct hit to Iran now. Now, the ambassador was not harmed, but he says that Iran will uh, respond in a decisive manner. Here is what the Ayatollah said today. The evil Zionist regime will be punished at the hands of our brave men. We will make them regret this crime and the other ones. So that's good. So now, again, you know, you come back to how is the United States going to benefit from this, right? In the Like when you look at this and we're talking about the United States involvement in this, it doesn't. The United States will be dragged into this and it will be a disaster for the American people. Yes, exactly I say, right. I just want to point out that we would be further dragged into this because we're already in it. Right. We're sending yeah. weapons and all this. So it would just be an escalation of our involvement. Yeah. Some people in the chat are saying, I stand with Israel. Um, others are saying, I see V. Weitman says Israel can fend for itself. So there's, you know, this conflicting people. People are saying, you guys make me nauseous with this. It's unbelievable. Like, so you really want the United States to be involved in this? You want the United States to be dragged further into this? That uh, should make all of us nauseous. Yeah, something that Candace Owens said today on X was, this seems like it was planned by globalists in order to sell us a war. Already we've been sold a war with Russia. Now we're being sold a war alongside Israel against well, Syria against Lebanon and against Iran. Do you want that? So you can say whatever you want pro-Israel and how Israel's defending itself, although I have questions about how you justify the attack on Gaza civilians. But now I'm asking, do you want, if, if you think, if you feel so strongly about Israel, will you put your kid in there along with the IDF soldiers and go off to war with Iran? I'm not. So that's my well, question. And also, it's like you get people that are that are supporting this and everything that's going on. But it's like I, I, I use an analogy like it's as if like there was a house in a neighborhood that killed a bunch of kids. Right. And so the city goes in and takes the police and destroys the whole city. Like the the re the, the retaliation is does not meet what happened. You know, whatever happened was tragic for sure. But like the, it's overkill. Yes. Overkill is. Is yes, an overkill the, of a word. Yes, it's the, too uh, on yeah. the nose. Right. Yeah. Now, it cannot be overstated that embassies have to be off limits. Let's review just the few times that the international community has stood up for the sovereignty and protection of embassies. In 2012, the UK threatened to storm the Ecuadorian embassy in order to get out Julian Assange. And there was an international uproar because once one embassy is compromised, they all are. You cannot break the sovereignty and safety. Uh, yesterday, Syrian journalist Kavor Kalmasian explained exactly why Israel wants to escalate the war with countries that are sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. And they want the US to partner up and fight with them. This is meant to change the equations in the region. Israel at the moment knows that its war in Gaza is not going well. They are not achieving military victories in the Gaza Strip. They are killing people, but they're mm -hmm. not achieving military victories in the Gaza Strip. However, the other camp, and this, is, this consists of Iran, Syria, Yemen, Hezbollah, and other non-state actors in the region, for example, in Iraq, they are actually giving tangible support to Hamas and Jihad and other groups in, in, in Gaza. And Israel wants to drag the Americans into a conflict in the region because they are unable to achieve the military goals that they have set for themselves. How can they do that? They can do that by dragging Syria into conflict so that there would be a regional war. Okay. Regional war. Are you in for it? Now, you can say my stomach is turned by this conflict in Gaza, but until, uh, can we stand for it now before the rest of us are dragged in? I mean, we want to do something about it now. I think most rational people want a ceasefire and no more deaths, right? Most rational people want that. 
But then what? And can we stand for international law? Can we just remind ourselves, I thought we'd you know, take a little trip down memory lane, about sovereignty of, of embassies. Uh, do you remember this guy? This is uh, the Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. He came to power in Iran after the British and Soviets overthrew his father, who they accused of collaborating with Hitler. He presided over Iran during a time of prosperity. And in 1963, he launched the White Revolution, which was an extensive agenda of socioeconomic reform with Western governments, which made him a friend of the West. He also oversaw the strong enforcement of Iran's young military, which has persisted ever since. So let's think twice about that before we mess with Iran. Uh, look at his wedding, incidentally, in 1959, as I was researching this story today. This was at the time Iran was considered a very progressive place. Look, the, the women didn't wear any Islamic garb. In fact, her, the bride's dress was designed by French designer Yves Saint Laurent. Uh, it's, he had also this crazy idea to turn the desert into a fertile plain and lush forest called Flowering Desert Project, but I digress. Uh, the Muslim world decided that he was Western aligned and for many reasons turned against him and he was ousted. He was then granted asylum in New York where he went for cancer treatment in 1979 and followers of the Ayatollah Khomeini demanded that the Shah be returned so that they could put him on trial and potentially execute him. That launched the Iran hostage crisis, bec and because it happened at the embassy. So uh, they, these followers were so pissed that they stormed the U.S. embassy in Iran. They held 52 Americans hostage for 444 days. President Carter authorized a military rescue mission, but it failed because how are you going to fight in Iran? Have we figured that out? by now, right? Is that what we want? He continued to negotiate for the release, but we all know then the actual release happened on Reagan's watch and Reagan did the victory lap for it. Now, the attack on our embassy was a huge deal for Americans who saw it as an attack on America, which it was. Uh, the U.S. responded with sanctions, but otherwise did not launch a major retaliation attack on Iran, at least not right then. And again, this question now is how will Iran attack to, uh, respond to an attack on their embassy? We have one other example of an attack on an embassy. In recent history, in 1999, NATO bombed the Chinese embassy in Serbia during their bombing pro project of Yugoslavia. They killed three Chinese journalists. Bill Clinton did apologize and said it was a mistake. And journalist Arnaud Bertrand, a popular French citizen who lives in China, said this about it. That, uh, let's see, the this is the only other historical incidents that we have in recent history of a bombing of an embassy. Bill Clinton apologized, but and he compensated the families and paid to rebuild the embassy, at least Western force forces did. All this highlights how profound a taboo this is in international relations. So here's what Edward Snowden had to say about it after Israel again killed the seven aid workers in Gaza and bombed the embassy. He said, the Netanyahu regime is now pulling off the rare feat of violating both the Geneva Conventions and the Vienna Convention at the same time. You're living through history, folks. Now, just an hour ago, the United Nations held an emergency meeting to respond to this. The meeting was caused by, uh, called by Russian First Deputy Permanent Representative to the UN, Dmitry Polyansky. She said this, after Israel's strike on the Iranian consulate in Damascus today, Iranians have turned to the UN Security Council to condemn this action. So the meeting is in fact today. The question is, will it matter? The U.S. only recently broke with Israel in the United Nations to abstain from a ceasefire vote, not even to veto it, not to vote against it or for it, but just abstain. So what will the United States do now if, in fact, an embassy has been bombed? Uh, and until that, when? Like, what's happening to international? What, will it even matter? Because ceasefires continue to be voted for in the United Nations, and Israel does not comply. So all this to say, is international law kaput? Now, is it gone? We don't have it? I mean, Does it mean anything? No, I mean, I don't think it's really meant anything for quite a while now. I mean, look what's happening in, in Ukraine. Um, look what's happening here. I don't think international law really has mattered much at all. And when we, when there is a violation of international law, the United States gets to step, step aside from it and basically say, well, we're not, we're not adherents to the International Criminal Court anyway, so we don't have to be a part of that. Um, that's not something that we need to be a part of anyway. Right. Well, let us know what you think of this, whether or not this actually is an escalation that will drag us all into a conflict, or is it something that Iran, Iran will let this slide? 
Is it in fact something that's going to blow up all international law, drag us all into war? Or are we being hyperbolic? Well, I just co-authored a new report specifically on the disaster that's unfolding right now in Africa and how the United States and its involvement in the Middle East is going head to head with Russia right now in the Red Sea. Of course, the you know the Russians the, uh, sent a, a number of warships into the Red Sea just a few days ago. And of course, this is all about resources and control in Africa and through the Red, the Red Sea channels and the Straits of Hormuz. And we are, will we take the bait? So you can go get this exclusive report that we just put together, redacted.inc slash Africa. We can go there to redacted.inc slash Africa and uh, grab that uh, grab that report. Again, that's uh, something we've been been working on uh, pretty hard. So I want you all to check out that um, exclusive report. So anyway, um, yeah, it's an absolute disaster. I can see there's a lot of there's a lot of differing opinions on this in the chat. A lot of people saying or not a lot of people. I think there's one person saying, Natalie, you're wrong about this. It wasn't a consulate. It wasn't an embassy. Um, okay, the, the United I just Nations, want to know how you know the, that. Yeah, the United Nations is calling it that, and uh, uh, it's a diplomatic compound. I mean, I, I don't know exactly what 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 the difference would be with that. Um, I think I admitted that I've never been there. Yeah, no, no. I mean, well, there is a difference yeah. between an embassy and a consulate. You know, a consulate is like the main the main body of a diplomatic compound in a in a particular country. And then, of course, you have the other sides of it, which are the um, which are the consulates, which act as sort of like the tentacles of the main embassy. Um, in but still, once you are on that property, you are in sovereign territory of. Yeah, the, it's considered. Yeah, basically, yeah. it's considered the diplomatic the diplomatic representation of a country. So right. it's, you know, it's completely off limits. It's something, again, we've not done in World War I, World War II, and we just don't, you just don't bomb consulates or embassies. Well, again, if that, if it's on, if it's on limits, if it's not off limits, right, then this is how you provoke attacks. Right. You can just attack a country inside your own country, then you don't have to worry about establishing naval bases around the world because you're ready to attack any country you want at any time. Is that, that's how we roll now? I'm just asking. Tony Breezy says redacted is wrong about Iran. So Tony, when you say a comment like that, please be specific. Redacted is wrong about Iran in what way? That they weren't, they weren't bombed? They weren't, like what, what specifically are, is, and we're reporting, I, mean, I, you know, I don't know exactly what's wrong, but you just be specific. When you make a comment like that, please be specific, okay? Um, and we know we love the feedback here. Let's see. Andrea Reed says, Clayton, you need to get a balanced account on the account of Israel. Listen to Douglas Murray. Okay. I, I've listened to Douglas Murray quite a bit. Um, yeah. I've yeah. read his books too. Yeah. So I've, I've listened to that. What do you mean balanced account? Like we're covering specific incidences here of, and I read a lot of books about the Middle East and certainly a lot about the history of Palestine and the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. So I think it's important to have a full understanding, a full rainbow understanding uh, from beginning to to where we are right now of the history of this region and talking to experts, too. I don't just rely on my own firsthand accounting of this. Um, so that's also important. All right. Um, and then Fa Funky Fam says Redacted is correct about Iran. So <laughs> back and forth opinions. Linda says no, Redacted okay. is you not You can wrong also tell us what we're, what we're correct about. Yeah, Tony, I'd love to see what you're about. specific. <laughs> no, please tell me, yeah. Or, they, or, the, or, the, or the two of you can just get together and talk about it and then... <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So just, pick a hash side. it out. Hash it out in the comments. Everybody yeah. just, just pick a side, you guys. Come on. We're not going to pick a side. That's not what we, what we do here, and we appreciate your comments, but you do have to be more specific about which part we're wrong about. Was it the hostage deal? Right. Was it uh, flowering of the desert? You know, you let us know. Yeah, let us know. Uh, we've got more news to get to here, though, on your, uh, what is today, Tuesday? Today's Tuesday. We're going to look at the sanctuary cities in the United States collapsing under the weight of illegal immigration. We're going to get there in a second. We're also going to talk about the World Economic Forum and the way in which the World Economic Forum can be beaten and the World Health Organization can be beaten. Well, one state in the United States may have a plan to stop them. We'll show you about that. Plus, we're going to have a bridge update. Uh, journalist Laura Logan is going to be joining us here. Investigative journalist Laura Logan is going to join us on the bridge collapse and the cyber attacks that we are seeing in the United States. Uh, but first, we have a store. We'd love to tell you about our store. Go to redactedstore.com if you'd like to check out some of our t-shirts, our hoodies, our mugs, our stickers. Um, we got some great photos from our viewers, are very kind. They've posted some great photos and emailed us and let us know um, about some of the hoodies and things that they picked up, and they sent us some pictures as well. Our t-shirts, our hoods, our hoodies, our mugs. Go to redactedstore.com is the place to go. Again, redactedstore.com. 
Well, Democrats have turned many American cities into sanctuary cities. Bring your illegal immigrants here. We will give them housing. We will give them money. We will feed them. We will take care of them. That all sounded like a great plan for Democrats until their cities have been overrun by illegal immigrants with tent cities being set up, people being kicked out of hotels. It's been a disaster. The city of Denver has experienced this firsthand with tens of thousands, I think over 40,000 now illegal immigrants pouring into the city of Denver. And now officials there are telling people, this video has gone viral, don't stay here in Denver. We will put you on a bus and we will we will send you on to greener pastures because it's gotten so bad here in Denver. Watch this. Someone who knows all about this is former Customs and Border Patrol uh, veteran and supervisor J.J. Carroll, 24 years in the Customs and Border Patrol, who's written the great book, Invaded. And he's been warning us about the dangers of what's going on to happen in these sanctuary cities for a while now. We wanted to invite J.J. on to give his uh, context here on this. J.J., welcome back to the show. Great to see you. Uh, thanks for having me back on, Clayton. This is a disaster, it seems. I mean, it, Democrats... I think during the Trump years, and they could certainly roll out these sanctuary city ideas when you didn't have illegal immigrants coming to those cities, it seems, right? There, you didn't have this influx of illegal immigrants. Then once Biden opens the border, it seems like now this stress test has totally failed. What's your sense of these sanctuary cities? Well, sanctuary cities are the greatest example of the left's hypocrisy. For decades, all throughout my career, but it has accelerated before Biden came in. And then when Biden came in, all the wheels fell off because the sanctuary cities lectured us from afar. Massachusetts, 2,500 miles away. New York City, over 2,000 miles. Philadelphia, over 2,000 miles. They lectured us about our lack of compassion, our inability to dig deep into our tax reservoirs to pay for illegal aliens. All that changed in about 2022 when all this influx of illegals, aliens came in and bombarded these cities. You showed, te you showed Denver. So let me just give you some statistics on Denver. Denver has serviced and provided services to only 39,000 illegal aliens. That's 39,000, Clayton, out of over 10 million that have poured into the country, okay? Denver has a population of 3 million people, so less than 3.5% of their total population, 39,000, has brought Denver to its knees in social benefits. Denver right now, in less than a year, 18 months, is a $120 million budget shortfall because of all the illegal aliens. I'll give you another data point, which is incredible about, about Denver. Denver illegal aliens have been to the hospital talking long-term stay, quick emergency rooms, thousands, millions of dollars, 20,000 times. So they have decimated the Denver medical system, okay? But when you go back, when you talk about the hypocrisy of the left, you have to go back. You can't look at it as a snapshot today. You have to go back to the timeline when they declared a state of emergency. Denver and Colorado declared a state of emergency when they had 1,000 illegal aliens in their services, just 1,000. They pulled the ripcord as fast as they could and said, state of emergency, we need federal help. Now, as you showed in the video, they're encouraging illegal aliens to leave their area to go and bombard Chicago, New York City. These are the same people that called DeSantis and Abbott a racist, xenophobe. They, they have no compassion or kindness because they were shipping illegals out of their city. The hypocrisy is so unbelievable. Now they're shipping them out, but you're seeing the degradation of America in the major cities, New York City, uh, Chicago, Philadelphia, I can go on and on, but Denver in particular, less than three and a half percent of their population has brought them to their knees, Clayton. Their social services are destroyed. They're cutting or have been cutting special social services, library hours, parks, 
renovations, police to to cover the shortfall of 120 million and counting every day. It's absolutely terrible. And we, of course, have heard from Denver residents who said, you know, I, I can't afford to even pay my rent. I can't afford to live here. You're cutting my social services. This city, your budget, you're crumbling. You're bringing these cities to their knees. And my question is, where are these, how are these uh, illegal immigrants getting to Denver? How are they getting to Chicago? Um, the Biden administration, I imagine, is putting them on buses, putting them on airplanes and flying them like right into the Denver International Airport. Well, there's two different ways. So first, the people that cross the border illegally, physically cross through El Paso, San Diego, Juarez, wherever, into America. They're processed as parolees under asylum claims. Then this is the most, you, you think I'm making this up. We give them a piece of paper that, te that they tell us that their name is John Smith and his real name is Mohammed Sheikh from Yemen. But now John Smith has a piece of paper the NGOs, we turn them over to Catholic Charities. Catholic Charities buys them a plane ticket wherever they want to go into America, taxpayer funded. And here's even the kicker. The kicker is two kickers. They get on the plane. You and I have to use a real ID. They're going to search us, do everything. Illegal aliens walk through the, with a piece of paper stating who they are. It's all fraudulent. The second kicker is many of these illegal aliens are flying first class to what? get where they need to go. First class, absolutely first class. Documented cases, people posting videos, everything first class. The second way they're doing it, and Todd Benzman from CIS.org did a FOIA, and, and now the federal government had to admit the 43 airports, they're international airports they're using when they're flying illegal aliens into America. So you have them now, the federal government is okaying illegal aliens to take international flights directly into the interior of the United States. So you have illegal aliens from Haiti, Venezuela, et cetera, fly, and, and that's what's happening in Denver. The Denver population of illegal aliens, prim, primarily Venezuelan. Venezuela released all of their prisons, okay? So you have all these people flying directly into Denver International Airport, walking off, getting with Catholic Charities, Jewish Family Services, and then taken to these shelters, and then they're provided money, uh, stipends, et cetera. And thus you have this million dollar, multi-million dollar shortfall of Denver and the citizens are paying it, but the citizens have to pay it. You voted for these people. You chastised people like myself down on the border and called us all vile names because you thought it was, it was morally, you were on a higher moral plane than us because you, you would open arms and bring all these people in. Well, we're sent, we just sent you 39,000. You can't handle 39,000. What about the other 10 million that came across? What about the other small cities and towns across America that are being devastated by this? Well, shouldn't all these Democrats in Denver that voted for this to be a sanctuary city open up their houses? I mean, they should, maybe they should pass a law that forces them to open up their houses and have all of these illegal immigrants from Venezuela who broke out or who were released from prisons let them sleep in your daughter's room. You know, what's, what's wrong with that, right? Let them sleep in your children's rooms. What's wrong with that? Open your, you know, we're xenophobes. We're racist. We're xenophobic. You should open up your houses to that. Make breakfast for them every morning. Yes. Well, here's the crazy part. You have people in Denver that are calling for that. Massachusetts governor's calling for it. New York, uh, Hochul from New York and, and Mayor Adams from New York City. They're asking their citizens, their residents, to open their houses to these people. Are you insane? That's like me just driving down a random highway, picking up a, a hitchhiker and say, hey, come on in, bud. Here's your, here's your guest room. Just roam around my house wherever you want. That's the insanity that we're living in. But that's how desperate they are. I mean, we can go down the list. Look, look at the state of Maine. State of Maine just paid $2.3 million to build a brand new apartment complex, fully furnished, just for illegal aliens. New York City now has serviced 175,000 illegal aliens in New York City. It has brought them to their knees. Now there's a new bill, Clayton, you won't believe this, because illegal aliens are so stressed from coming across the border that now there's a bill inside this, this, the legislature in New York to allocate minimum, minimum $15 million for mental health services for illegal aliens. This is the insanity, but you have to understand, like, let's say that, you know, I live in Kansas, 
a, a, a normal Kansas will say, well, that's just New York City. But you have to understand the federal government's backstopping all of these financial losses. That's why you saw Mayor Adams in New York City flip flop. He was hardcore. No more, no more, no more. OK, now we can take them. Well, what happened? New York City's at a $12 billion deficit. That's with a B, not, a, not an M. $12 billion deficit, OK, because illegals. And he's telling them, bring more and more. Well, what changed? What changed is the federal government is backstopping. So your dollars, your tax, this is April. April 15th is around the corner for tax day. Your tax dollars are paying for these people to live for free in America. You know, Denver has asked its residents to, you know, start renting to illegal migrants, right? So, okay, they haven't gone as far, I think, as New York and open up your homes and just allow them to move in, right? But you should rent to illegal migrants. So imagine if you're a property owner that owns a rental property and you have a normal, a normal tenant, American tenant who has citizenship and has proof of income. Now you're being asked by the Denver City Council to rent your property out to an illegal migrant. I'm sure they're going to have all the, the paperwork and I'm sure that they're going to have all of the funding that would allow them to live in this property, right? Well, what you would do is you'd bring those people in. I've seen it. I've seen these squat houses. I see what they've done to communities all through uh, Arizona and Southern California. They destroy them. They, okay, they will, get, they will get money from rent check, whatever they're going to call it in Denver. They're going to they're gonna subsidize all this rent. So what these families will do is they will be smart. And they'll say, I lived in squalor. Wherever I came from, I lived in squalor. You lived in squalor. Why don't we go move into this two-bedroom apartment We'll put three, four families in it. Now we all pay $200 a month instead of 1300 And now we're making money. And they'll just destroy it. And then good luck, really, really good luck to you, landlord, getting them out of your, out of your apartment or your home. It's not going to happen. They're going to put all kinds of restrictions on you. You would be an absolute fool, but there are people that are going to do it because they're going to see the cash grab, but they're going to pay dearly in the end. Yeah, absolutely. So your little your little nice little house that you renovated in Wheat Ridge, Colorado, that's now like probably worth like six hundred, seven hundred thousand. You're going to rent that property out, and uh, you're going to have former you know uh, criminals uh, that have been released from Venezuelan prisons living in your property. They've got a check because it's been subsidized by the Biden administration and taxpayer dollars. Going to move in and trash the home and destroy the home, and that's exactly what we're seeing well, over and over again. But what you will also see. Clayton, and it's the thing that's never really discussed, is once these families move into your neighborhood, your beautiful, pristine neighborhood, you will start to see prostitution, you will see drug running, you will see human trafficking, you will see child trafficking. In your little suburban home in Colorado, tucked away in the mountains, thinking you're immune to this. You're not immune to any of this. This is going, they're gonna move in, and literally crime will spring up out of nowhere. Look at Whitewater, Wisconsin, same thing, 15,000 people. They brought in 1,000 individuals from Nicaragua and Venezuela. Crime is rampant. The, I, I spoke to the chief of police uh, last week. He goes, we're out of, it's out of control. We, we're seeing kidnappings, rapes, sexual abuse of, of minors. We're seeing everything that we never saw before. We were a sleepy little town in Wisconsin. Now we're a crime mecca. And I, and I told him, well, sir, I apologize that this is happening, but this is not gonna go away. And this is what's happening across America. What's happening in Denver is happening in every major city and it is spilling over now because the major cities, Clayton, are completely saturized. They do not have any more space. Look what's happened in Chicago and New York. They are doing 30 and 60 day evictions. So they're evicting homeless people back on the street. They have to go through another wel the welcome center and then get re put put back into the system and wait 30 days to apply to get back into a shelter. What do you think that looks like over six months, a year? You have people that are angry, resentful, they're tired, they're dirty, they're hungry, their kids are crying, they're sick. Do you think they're just gonna sit and take it? These are men, majority all men, from worn torn nations. You're gonna tell me they're not talking amongst each other and saying, look how fat, lazy, and, and, and soft America is. We can take this. We yeah. can take it. Don't think and, that they're not talking like that, America, because they are. And they are. And of course, we know this through social media apps and of course, 
Uh, this is, you know, this is what we've been covering here on the show. One of their, one of their leaders on social media was just arrested by ICE. I'll get you out of here on that question. So, JJ, we had that that guy who, you know, that sort of, uh, uh, I guess, illegal immigrant influencer who was telling everyone, you know, squat in people's homes, come to the United States. Here's how you do it. You're going to get free money. Papa Biden is giving you free money. You can squat in people's homes. He was arrested by ICE uh, over the weekend. Um, to me, that seems like a show, right? He's like a target, right? Because he was he was on social media. But how many more? It's like a Hydra. How many more of him are there out there, right? He, he's just sort of a, a figurehead in this. He gets arrested, but that's that's nothing, right? Right. He he just he's one of millions. I actually like the guy because he validated everything that I always say. Every time he popped up a new video, I would go, "You don't have to listen to me. Listen to him." But when you listen to what he would say, and he's from Venezuela, he didn't say anything that was factually untrue, Clayton. Everything he said was actually true. And here's the dirty secret that ICE won't tell you. you we cannot, America cannot deport anyone back to Venezuela because Maduro told us to pound sand a couple months ago and said, you are, we're not taking back anyone that left our country. So now you own them. So they, th through our laws, we can't hold him for indefinitely. So you will see that that gentleman be released back into America very soon. You'll see it. It's going to happen. That's what that the, to, to bring it all together, Clayton, understand how weak we are as a nation, that nations that are crumbling. Venezuela is crumbling. They're telling us to bend a knee and to, to follow their demands. And we do. And we do. Donald Trump didn't do that. Donald Trump said, no, you're taking a background, taking all your your foreign aid away. And know what they all did? Across the globe, not just the Latin American countries, across the globe, every major leader bent the knee and said, yes, sir, I'll take back my people. So we were having, they call it 21 day flights across the globe. ICE was drop, deporting people all day, all night, 365 days a year. And that stopped under Biden. Well, you reap what you sow. Look at these sanctuary cities. All you need to do is look at Denver right now to see the disaster unfolding. J.J. Carroll is the author of the great book, Invaded. Uh, you should go check out this book. I think it should be a must read. Everyone should read this book. Go to Amazon right now and read the book. Uh, J.J., thank you so much for joining us as always. And uh, we will continue to watch this, see what happens in these sanctuary cities. Thanks, J.J. Thank you, Clayton. Much appreciated, JJ. And uh, Sean in the chat just asks here, Sean Parker in the chat says, Clayton, can squatters rights get squashed? Illegal migrants should have no right taking over someone's house. Well, squat, you know, being an illegal migrant has nothing really to do with squatters. I mean, it really you, doesn't. You can be a squatter and be an American citizen. Now, the problem is that a lot of these, you know, a lot of these states have very lax squatters laws. So it just so happens that the Biden administration is giving these these illegal immigrants parole status in the United States, and they're allowing them to walk free in the United States. And then therefore those exact same people who are now allowed under the Biden administration to live and walk free in the United States can then take advantage of the squatters rights. Mm -hmm. So squatters rights has always and, been a problem. And, uh, Florida, uh, Florida is actually going after squatters rights in a big way right now. Uh, right. Passing legislation to finally to, to undo a lot of that. Yeah. So because they're, well, they're, I'm they're going the only state I know of right now that it is. I, for years, I remember going back to my days on Fox and Friends when I used to anchor there. I remember I did an interview with a guy who literally looked like a vampire. Oh, and, yes, uh, I remember, remember that this guy. guy? And I, he came up on this show, but he had like managed to stop individuals who were like squatting on his property. It was something like that. Anyway, I remember doing repeated stories about Florida and squatters. Yeah. They were taking advantage of Florida squatters law. So finally, Florida is putting their foot down. Um, on that, which is which is great, and we're we actually coming up here on the show in a minute. We have another state that's putting its foot down against the World Economic Forum. So I think we're looking at states now. State legislatures are now putting taking a stand against some of these draconian laws, squatters, individuals, uh, the World Economic Forum, um, uh, the World Health Organization. Who am I missing? I know you're typing furiously here. I don't know if you're, if you're, are you text, are you typing to the Biden administration right now, there? Telly? No. She's like a st court stenographer. She's like, I am like I'm a going court to, stenographer. I'm going after all, I'm going after all these assholes. I'm saying something to our team right now <laughs> about 
yeah, I something say, I there, want there have been times to be that, done differently. <laughs> yeah, there have been times that I've I've said something like sent a text to the group thing during the show, like, hey, this this thing is wrong, so can you go to go to this? And Natalie will will give like a four page reply, and I don't even see her fingers move. And I've I've asked I'm her before, it's like, like how she's how like, do you do that? She's I have like, a chip, an she, implant chip, I can tell. Nanotech. Now she's like Kramer in that episode where he she he's he's the he he gets he's uh, hired on the Murphy Brown show, and yeah. they, like they have him, he's the new secretary for Murphy Brown, and he's like. They're like, I don't know what you're doing, but I keep doing what you're doing. He's like, yeah, I'm a good typer. Okay. I just want everyone to know that this is what we're going to do now is we're going to call each other out for not paying attention when the other person's talking. Noted. <laughs> you won't it. like that. So I'm just sending oh, that to Cl- Klaus Schwab. He can suck it. Okay. All right. Klaus Schwab. Next time Schwab. I think that you're not paying attention to my uh, No, no. I, I, thought, I, thought you were, I thought you were doing something about that. That's what I was asking about. You're right. Okay. All you right. literally drafted whole legislation uh, right Anyone now. in the chat want to keep score? <laughs> That was that he he fired the first shot. Uh, he started it, and I will finish it. No, I will end it. Um, all right, so we've got more news to <laughs> we got more news to get to here on the show. <laughs> Marriage. <laughs> Um, All right, this is what we're going to do. Is we're going to talk about the World Economic Forum, and then we're going to talk about the bridge collapse. We have a guest, Laura Logan. I'm very excited to speak to her. I've uh, been a big fan of her since 60, her 60 Minutes days. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm glad to have her on Redacted. I, did you, uh, I hope to ask her also if she'll be my friend. Okay. Uh, and we'll we'll see about that because I may or I may not I may or, I may or may not ask her if she'll be your friend. <laughs> okay. But, uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, okay. Well, how do you kick out the World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum, and the United Nations all in one fell swoop? Uh, we won't be able to because the Biden administration wants to hand sovereign power to all of those organizations. But the state of Louisiana is saying then we'll do it ourselves. You want something done? You got to do it yourself. The Senate passed a law forbidding the state from cooperating with the World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum, and the United Nations. They will decide the laws in their state, not international unelected globalists. This is very punk rock. Now, it's interesting because we haven't given you an update on this world pandemic treaty in a while, and we're going to take a look at it in a second. And I feel like every time we talk about this, I need to prove to you again how bonkers it is because the mainstream media says it's not giving up sovereign power. It will not force laws on your country. But then you go and read it, and that's exactly what it says. You don't have to be a conspiracy theorist or anyone who's just out there to believe that that is the case. So the World Economic Forum is hoping, sorry, the WHO is hoping to put this treaty up for a vote in May, which is interesting because we don't have a draft to read. So what is it they're trying to sneak in there? under the radar as countries increasingly get nervous we're going to talk more about that yeah they ahead. do they do not want us to read this no they are being because the last time, the we, last read time this, we read it we were pretty stinking alarmed yeah and they the the last time that we read it and we had a chance to get a preview copy of it and go through it is when certain african nations said absolutely not we're not moving forward with this so yeah. they don't want people to read this it, like nancy pelosi said you have to pass the legislation first in order to read it Right. Famously. Right? Yeah. You have to pass yeah. the budget first, then you can read it later. After you Well, pass it. let's say that Joe Biden signs this pandemic treaty, which he says that he is going to do. Well, then the rest of the U.S. would have agreed to surveillance by the World Health Organization, tracking vaccine mandates. They will agree that infodemics are real. And even if you're talking about true information, they have to tamp it down if it will alter your behaviors. Uh, These are all things we've looked at these things. We've looked at it in the PDFs that the WHO has published. It's not conspiracy. Uh, So then the question is, could Louisiana be an island, make themselves exempt The rest of the country would have to fall in line except states that pass a law like this. It's interesting, right? Now, this is only passed in the Senate. It will move into the House and the state committee. So there's no saying that it actually passes in Louisiana, but it's an interesting question. Uh, My guess is that if it does pass, the Biden administration will use your tax dollars to litigate and try to stop it from being implemented. Uh, That's just a guess, though. Pretty safe. I I would put that guess at... 75%. I would go 90%. Okay. I'm going to go 90% on that. They will not allow this to to be put into place. Now, here's a reminder, though, because there are two resolutions in Congress to stop the president from signing up for any WHO pandemic treaty unless he gets congressional approval. We have Senate Resolution 81, 
has gone nowhere, was introduced in February of 2023, went to committee, there it stayed. We also have a bill called No Pandemic Preparedness Treaty Without Senate Approval Act. Same deal. Went Was introduced in February of 2023, went to committee, nothing happened yet. So in other words, Congress is doing nothing about this. They pay lip service to handing sovereignty over, say, oh, we really don't want this. Here's a bill. It's not even moving in. Look at the congressional pages, websites for these bills. It has, and you click on the, you can either see the text, who are the sponsors, and then actions. Nothing. Bubkiss, goose egg, Bueller. Literally, no one gives a crap except Louisiana, it seems. And here's just a reminder of what is at stake, because the WHO, again, is trying their best to pass this pandemic treaty, which would give them the authority to do all of these things. Here's a slide I made over a year ago, define the next pandemic, determine lockdowns, give them surveillance power, determine treatments, put in place vaccine mandates, uh, control all vaccine distribution, control all IP and profits, and literally redistribute everything because they have said that if they think any land use is putting a pandemic threat so for instance, cows are over here. We don't like that. People live over here. That also could raise the threat of disease. They can literally redistribute all resources. It's bonkers, I tell you. You will own nothing and you will be happy about it. Right. So let's say that this would be an issue, would fall to the states. Here is how Louisiana is handling it. Here is just the one paragraph saying in their new bill, of what they're putting into place, saying the WHO, the United Nations, and the World Economic Forum shall have no jurisdiction or power within the state of Louisiana. No rule, regulation, fee, tax, policy, or mandate of any kind from these organizations shall be enforced or implemented by the state of Louisiana or any agency Department, board, commission, political subdivision, government entity of the state, parish, municipality, or any other politically entity. It's basically, this is what I thought of when I saw this, Sarah from Labyrinth saying, you have no power over me. That's how she gets out of the labyrinth. That's what we all have to do, you guys. That's all you have to say to the Goblin King to get yourself out of this dystopic reality. So at least one state is doing it. Uh, guess what's even more terrifying because the WHO vote for the pandemic treaty is coming up in May. They are supposed to have circulated the draft four months prior to the vote, and they have not done that. Here is Australian MP Malcolm Roberts warning about this. Here's the World Health Organization's problem. The World Health Organization constitution and their own international health regulations now prohibit the vote. Schedule two, article 55 of the international health regulations requires all matters being voted to be circulated four months before. We're two months out and Health Department FOI 4941 reveals that the changes are still being worked out. The requirement for advance notification to allow member nations full time and debate and decide has to debate and decide has not been met and now cannot be met. Secondly, Article 21 of whose constitution says the regulations can cover only international matters, international measures. The WHO Constitution does not provide for expanding international health regulations to cover our own, domestic, our own Australian domestic health response, for example, closing borders. May's vote is contrary to the WHO's Constitution and proposes a scope outside the World Health Organization's Constitution. I ask the Health Minister to reconsider voting on WHO changes because it will be challenged in the International Health Court of Justice under the WHO Constitution's Article 75. The government wants, this government wants to sign away more of our sovereignty and hand health decisions to the murdering rapists under whose former terrorist leader, Tedros. The rule of law must apply to everyone, including the World Health Organization. All right. Okay. Wow. A ter murdering terrorist that is Tedros. Oh, let's remind yeah. you why he's calling the WHO murdering rapist. We did a full story about how the WHO covered up its rapes and assaults in Congo, please seek that out from just a few months ago, uh, because you have to remember they're sovereign. They set their own rules. They don't even pay, pay taxes. So yes, they are horrific. They should not get more power in the world. That's what I'm saying. What do you say? You're going to have to tell your elected officials about that. Either pass a bill like this or everyone move to Louisiana if they do.
Right. Good for Louisiana. And that, and that, yeah. that brings up a yeah. That brings up a good point though, because maybe maybe you can remind me of this because I know you've you've studied this a lot more than I have, but I don't recall voting uh, for my representative at the WHO. <laughs> Uh, was that mm-hmm. on a separate ballot or how, how did, did you guys get one in Portugal or I don't remember. It was a mail-in it. ballot. Yeah, it was a mail-in ballot. Uh, so you might, it, someone probably handled it for you. So you probably didn't even have to fill it out. Someone probably just stuffed it in there and took care of it. No, there is no voting on these, these globalists. They are unelected globalists and we have no say in them. We have no say in what NATO is doing. We have no say in what the World Health Organization is doing. We have no say in what the world, uh, the WEF is doing. Yeah. And they run everything. Right. And we are conceding sovereign power to them. It'll be interesting to see the back and forth, though, between the Department of Justice, the Bi- you know, the Biden administration, and states like Louisiana and others that are that are setting their own boundaries on this. Well, at the very least, we see politicians abroad saying, "Wait a minute, we." We might not like this. The The conversation has been, the volume has been turned up to the point where some politicians are listening. Joe Biden's not. His hearing aid's off. Right. He, will, he has said, like this, I'll sign it. Why? Why would he be so motivated to go r- running full speed off this cliff? Ask yourself that question. Uh, and, you know, uh, let us know how much that plays into your because vote in 2024. The guy, these are the guys, they place him in the presidency because he's made a deal with the devils. Like, that's how you get elected, right? They make a deal with the devil. He gets placed in here by the deep state. He does the bidding of the deep state. He's a meat puppet. Just like when they passed that day of trans visibility the other day, uh, the proclamation from the White House that was released on by the White House and Biden came out and was asked about it at a press conference, and he said, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Of course he didn't do that. He's not in control of his White House. They're just pu- they're going to publish things on his behalf and tell him where to sign and what to do, and he doesn't know what he's doing. Right. Um, yeah, so his Twitter posts are way too articulate to be him. He's I not writing those. Are you him. kidding no, me? I, I would absolutely love it if they just gave him his phone and said, hey, you can tweet yourself from now on because we just get a bunch of like, <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I mean, so what what bothers me so much about this is we all know that in 2020, President Trump withdrew from the World Health Organization and then President Biden signed us right back up. And so that was, in essence, our vote. Right. Right. Is that we got to vote for Joe Biden, who said he would do this and he did it. The problem with the pandemic treaty is we've shown you the drafts is that they've removed the clause for non-binding and so whatever we may sign in May may be really hard to untangle ourselves from, even if President Trump is elected. So w- like it or not, this is part of your 2024 vote for president if you are an American voter. So let us know how much that plays into it. I guess it. the silver lining in that is that the U.S. is notoriously bad at, uh, at keeping our word and treaties. So I guess we don't really have to worry about it if we right. don't want to. Right. But we've showed you the WHO funding before, and a lot of it still comes from us. Uh, that was one of the main reasons Donald Trump opposed it, because he's like and NATO funding. Right. We, we pay more than other countries, and I don't like that, and I don't think it's fair. Um, so, you know, again, I don't need to make the point again. Well, this afternoon, or just we just got some breaking news from on the Financial Times. NATO plans a hundred billion dollar Trump proof fund for Ukraine. So listen to this. It'd be a five year plan that Trump wouldn't be able to undo, to your point, right? So this is, NATO is drawing up plans right now to secure a five-year military aid package for Ukraine, $100 billion, and it wouldn't allow, and it would basically protect them from a Trump presidency. So it would siphon money out of the United States, and Trump wouldn't be able to do anything about it. But look at how they're trying to supersede our vote, right? right? So we would vote for somebody who would either sign us up for these things or not. And they're saying, we're worried that Americans will vote for this person who says he'll do this. So we'll take the power out of that so they can't vote for it. So your will is worth Nothing. Piss. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, the fact that they're doing that might, you know, make people confident that they know something that we don't. <laughs> like, are they foreshadowing? Yeah. A Trump presidency? Maybe. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, like today, there was, or yesterday, there was a live stream, a Biden Harris live stream that people could tune into, and there was like 57 people watching. Punk. Like, think about 
the amount of the excitement for a Biden Harris presidency, a repeat, 57 people were watching. There's now about 40,000 of you watching, 20,000 on YouTube right here on our show, 20,000 on Rumble, a few thousand of us on X. There's no excitement at all for the Biden Harris regime right now. And so they NATO knows it and they're trying to get out in front of this and trying to protect against some sort of a Trump presidency that he might slash budgets and money to Ukraine and not want to send any money to NATO and not to the World Health Organization and all of this. 81 million votes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Right. Record breaking. <laughs> All right. We've got more news to get to here on your uh, Tuesday. Just a few quick uh, super chats here. Um, Anwar says, I just want to know if it's fair game for Iran now to strike inside of Israel. How would the U.S. respond if this was done to us? It's like an embassy was struck or a consulate was struck in the United States. I think you know the answer to that. What would happen in the United States? It's hard to say, though, under the Biden administration, they're allowing an invasion to happen right now in the U.S. and not doing anything about it. Jazzy Room Jams says, a member for nine months thanks for being a rebel a redacted rebel for nine months yesterday on our show can you show our rundown here philip yesterday there was a typo on our rundown yesterday um and we, last week we covered kosovo here on the show yes and we covered we covered i think we're probably the only like independent news show to really cover serbia regularly on this show anyway yesterday there was a typo and kosovo was the last topic here that was left over from last week's rundown so that was a, a yes. se- that was a segment we did last Thursday on the show. I encourage you to go watch that interview about Kosovo. Yes, okay. you still can watch it. So please yes. do. Uh, we didn't have anything new. Well, it'll yesterday. be actually the the standalone part of it. You could watch the live. The standalone part of it will probably come out tomorrow because we had a, a, a okay a busy oh. weekend. So. Okay. Uh, so while the, we're talking about tomorrow. Be, will... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh-huh, go ahead. Go ahead. You finish. No, I was gonna, I was gonna, the other thing I was going to say the Kosovo thing. I did catch it fairly early in the in the show i was looking at it and i was like why does that what does that say well you're too slow for jazzy like, jazzy room James. you got some <laughs> very very eagle-eyed observers some <laughs> sometimes yeah there might be you know something missing here but this is usually the stories that we're covering in the show and then sometimes we'll we might even add in something as like breaking news is happening during our live show and we might on the fly add in another story but yeah the kosovo thing was a leftover from last week it was just a typo you anyway, guys are eagle-eyed brilliant people i'm telling you all right we've got, uh, but before, as long as we're talking about the schedule I do want to let you know there's no live stream tomorrow and Thursday. We're taking a quick break uh, while the kids are out of school still. They have two stinking weeks for Easter. That's yeah. egregious. Uh, so we are going to, we've been working for their whole spring break, um, but yeah. we are off just tomorrow and Thursday for the live stream. We'll be back on Monday. So there will be content for you. I just wanted to make sure that you knew that. Uh, we're going to get to our next story here on the bridge collapse. And Laura Logan is going to join us, uh, I believe, to talk about the bridge collapse and an update there on the cyber attacks that could be coming to the United States. Um, her reporting on that and uh, some pretty interesting information I want to talk to her about. But first, it's no secret if you're tuned in, you know experts are predicting a recession headed our way. U.S. dollar is in real trouble right now. And one of the ways you can tell that is when the Fed just threw up their hands last week and said, you know, inflation, we're just going to let it run for a while. We're just going to let it run because we can't do anything about it anymore. And so right now, the way to devalue your currency and to kind of get your hand around all of the interest payments on the debt right now, which is going to hit $1.6 trillion, just the interest payments alone on the U.S. debt by the end of this year. The only way to do that is to, you know, devalue your currency. So if you've got any of your financial future tied to the U.S. dollar, I'd be very concerned about it. Um, We are big proponents on this show of owning real estate, owning tangible, real things like gold, like silver, like real estate. Those are very important to our future and making sure that we're protecting our family's future. Um, And our friends over at Lear Capital can help you buy gold and have it shipped right to your house. They're fantastic. They are a patriotic American company, thousands of five-star reviews. They've been in business for decades, and they love to talk to our viewers on the phone. So just write this 800 number down and give them a call and say, hey, you know, I've got $500 that I'd like to convert over to gold or silver. Um, Estimates are that gold could hit upwards of $3,000 an ounce. It just hit a new all-time high. Um, Again, Bank of America has it hitting $3,000 There's reports of it hitting $3,200, predictions of $3,200 an ounce for gold. Um, And you're seeing people pouring into gold right now because of the uncertainty of the U.S. dollar and what's happening with these wars around the world. Anyway, gold has been around for 5,000 years as a store of value. 
Uh, give them a call, 1-800-613-3557. Just have a conversation with them. Maybe you want to convert a portion of your savings into precious metals that you can store on-site in your own safe if you want or off-site in a storage facility that's under protection 24-7. Um, you can also go to their website, learredacted.com, and uh, you'll get your free gold and silver guide. It's just a free download that you can get just to learn more, download it for free, sit around, talk with your spouse about it, your partner, whatever, and decide if it's something that you want to do. Um, it's a big part of what we believe in right now, and I'm glad, we were, I'm glad we're investors in it. It's not, really nice when you invest in something and you see it going up and up and up and up. But I have to admit something. Even if it doesn't go up, I don't care. Gold and silver to me is a store of value. It's a protection against inflation, and it's a it's a wealth preservation mechanism. It's not. I don't care that it goes up a few dollars or down a few dollars. To me, it's it's real, tangible asset. Unlike the U.S. dollar, which is fake money that they can print willy nilly. Anyway, LearRedacted.com is the website. LearRedacted.com. Well, the cargo ship that struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore was most certainly caused by a cyber attack. Excellent journalist Laura Logan confirmed that last week, speaking to her intelligence sources, both inside the Biden administration, who are currently there still working, and outside the Biden administration confirming this. This was a cyber attack. And now we're learning that the shipping company that owns the ship just filed a court document, a legal petition, saying we had nothing to do with this. Quote, the bridge collapse was not due to any fault, neglect, or want of care on the part of the petitioners, the vessel, or any persons or entity for whose acts petitioners may be responsible. That sounds like something that was written in the 1700s, but it is, in fact, a modern document, and they're saying, hey, in other words, yeah, it was our ship, but we didn't have any control over that ship. Investigative journalist Laura Logan is the great journalist who broke the cyber attack story initially, and we're thrilled to have her here on Redacted. Laura, great to see you. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Clayton. So, so many questions, of course, emerging about this, but I just want to get first your reaction to the ship. Now, this could be playing insurance politics with this. We had nothing to do with this. You know, we had nothing to do with this, but now you're having the owners of the ship coming out and saying, we weren't... A we had nothing to do with this. Not, not, not the captains, not the people piloting the ship. The ship itself was not broken. There was nothing wrong with this. We didn't have anything to do with this. What's your response to that? So this is a very interesting statement because it is very definitive. You know, it's not, they're not hedging their bet. There's no wiggle room there. They are stating in very clear terms that they are not in any way responsible. So if it comes to questions of, you know, maintenance, was the ship's gear up to standard? You know, was there um, an error from the captain or the crew? They're, they're telling you in legal terms that none of that is true according to them. Now, we, you know, as a journalist, I'm always conscious of what I don't know. And we really don't have any, we, I have not spoken to the owners of the ship. You know, I have not talked to the company. I'm not in contact with their lawyers. So I'm not going to speculate or try to guess what's in their minds. We can go by what they have filed, that's significant. But what I will tell you here, Clayton, is, is over the years, because I've been a journalist now for more than 35 years, one of the things that I have learned to look for is the absence of normal, right? Because there is a pattern of life. There's a pattern to the way things are always done. We talk about it often, right? When somebody is killed, there's a normal expectation of how people grieve. And when people grieve differently, well, you always say, well, that's a, that's a little bit odd what's going on there, right? And it raises a red flag and you ask a question. So these are what you call indicators. They're not definitive by any means, but they are indicators. And so in this kind of situation, we have the, the you know, we have two strong, well, four very strong indicators that are abnormal. One is that the, you know, this company has filed this very definitive statement in a court of law. Right, so it's not just something that they're spinning to the media. They're willing to go on record in a, in a legal forum. So that adds some weight to it. Then you have the fact that we haven't heard from any of them. I mean, normally in a situation like this, especially with something as big as the strategic port of Baltimore, the biggest strategic port on the Eastern seaboard, one of the most important hazardous materials corridors in the United States of America. 
I mean, really a critical linchpin of the Baltimore economy and something that is going to impact people for years to come, right? And people are going to feel it at the gas pump, at, you know, in the grocery store and all across industry. This is going to have a massive impact on people's lives. Now, it may not be a catastrophic impact that you sense, you know, overnight, but it is nevertheless um, of such significant strategic significance that it's very odd that you see this being downplayed and minimized, right? So that raises another question. Then when you see it very, very quickly, the uh, people like the FBI come out and say definitively, this is not a cyber attack. You know, when you haven't had time to investigate it, and also if you know anything at all about cyber attacks, right? These are the most difficult attacks in a sense to prove because they're invisible. You can't see this happening. And, um, and also, as you know, like, you know, sometimes my daughter will call me from her bedroom in the same house. Well, that phone call, you know, as your audience, I'm sure knows, you know, it didn't go straight from her bedroom to my bedroom. It went to a tower somewhere, went to another tower and another tower. And at the base of every tower is a server. And these things ping all over the world. Well, you, you know, it's very difficult to trace when, when a, a signal, a GPS signal is spooked, when somebody else takes con really, you know, takes over that signal and is feeding inputs into it that, uh, that, that deceive and mask its true path. So that the people on board the ship are looking at it, they say, oh, the ship's on course, but it's the middle of the night and they're looking out, maybe some, somebody on the crew is looking out and they're a little bit confused because it doesn't quite look like they're in exactly the right spot, but they look again at the GPS. Oh, it says we're on course. These are, this, is, this is something very easy to identify. You can see when it's happening, if you know what you're talking about, if you work in intelligence or cyber attacks or counterintelligence or, you know, or for the, the CIA, many other uh, places across our government where we have qualified people who know what they're looking at. Um, but when you now get into the investigative process, and you now have to find that footprint, good luck, right? It's the exact same thing. You know, I, I laugh at the people who say, oh, this, this crazy journalist is now linking this to the voting machines. The point is that if you can't see inside those machines and you don't read code, you have no chance of knowing what happened. And if you, you know, it's very easy for programmers to write code that masks what they did, that hit it. So really with cyber, this is an invisible crime. And, and so that's another red flag. When you have something like an invisible crime and you have investigators who haven't even investigated coming out being definitive, that is abnormal, right? That's not what normally happens in these situations. And then the fourth thing that's a big red flag for me, it's very easy and for anyone with half a brain, anyone who's a decent journalist, can talk to any number of people across industry, across the oil industry, across, you know, in Baltimore, in, in um, any one of our strategic think tanks. I mean, you name it. There is no denying that the port of Baltimore is an absolutely critical strategic port and that this was a massive, you know, almost nuclear hit on our critical infrastructure. So when you see people out there en masse attacking and denying that very simple provable fact, that's also another big red flag indicator that there's more going on here. Yeah, almost immediately the Biden administration comes out in the morning. President Biden makes a mm -hmm. statement before his flight to North Carolina. We've identified nothing to see here, nothing nefarious. We are going to rebuild everything, which I don't recall them saying that about East, Pal East Palestine, Ohio or Lahaina yeah. or anything else. Right. Mm -hmm. This is we're going to fix it. Don't worry about it. Nothing to see here. We're going to get that port back up and running again and then flies off. The NTSB hadn't yet investigated. They admitted two days later they hadn't even arrived on the ship yet to start their initial assessment to find out if there was any other electronic recording, then recovering the black box with two minutes of missing data from the critical moment. How can they make that assessment? How can the FBI and the White House make that assessment? And then you have cybersecurity experts on the inside in the intelligence community telling you this was a cyber attack and they're lying about this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely correct. Everything you just said is 100%. And your audience will be nodding their heads, right? Because they know. People know in their gut. <clears throat> you know, with the last election, no one since Grove McCleveland, right? It was more than, I think it was 136 years. No incumbent had grown their vote with their base, with independents, and with minorities, and ever lost an election. 
So before you even address one single court case or one, you know, one single polling station or anything else, people knew in their gut, hey, something's not right here. And right. that's exactly what you're talking about. And then it's confirmed, right, by all of these red flags with on their own, this is troubling. But when you take all of those things together, they start to add up to a very troubling picture. And when you look, you know, one thing I know for sure, Clayton, and I, I bet you can recognize this too, along with many other people at this point, when you see the level of um, effort, time, effort, and resources are great indicators for how important it is for them to suppress something. So if I was saying something that wasn't true, that didn't have any substance to it, why bother to come after me with such ferocity? Why are you pouring so much time and effort into trying to discredit me if everything I'm saying is untrue? You know, and the reason for that is that, you know, is that when things are true, they have, an, they have this awful habit of just sticking, right? Because a lie has no legs. It's just like that bridge when you took out that anchor point. What happens? It just starts to collapse. And what do you have to do? You have to keep telling more lies to hold that up. And so when you're telling the truth, it just, it's that there's that nagging thing in the back of somebody's mind when they're like, wow, they just can't dismiss it because they know that it's true. Now, if you're ideologically blinded or you're determined not to see the truth no matter what, or you've been so manipulated and deceived at this point, you're sitting in your feedback loop, your manipulated you know, technology feedback loop, only hearing the things you want to hear, only, you know, having your views reaffirmed, well, then maybe it's difficult for you to go outside of your bubble. But when, when you look at all these people, like, you know, I have uh, people close to me who get upset and they say, oh, look at all these bots and all these negative comments on your page. I look at that and I say, that's great because that means I've broken through my feedback loop, right? That little bubble they wanted to keep me in where I couldn't reach anybody else. I broke through that. And you know what? It's not up to me to convince people. My job is to gather the facts, use reliable sources, vet and verify. And when I've done that, I'm willing to put my reputation on the line and, uh, and to put that out. But it's up to the audience that people can make up their own minds. I'm not trying to convince you of anything. What I can tell you is I was told the day that it, that happened to look out for more smaller uh, incidents, particularly incidences involving critical infrastructure, but also with waterways and bridges. And what happened? There was another barge that crashed into a bridge over the weekend. Now, I haven't investigated that. I'm not stating anything definitive on that at all. But it's, it, you know, it stood out to me because I was warned days in advance to expect to see something more like that. And you know why? You know why I was told that, Clayton? Because the people that I have been speaking to were trained in this type of warfare by the United States government. They have carried out these kinds of attacks in other countries. When you are dismantling a country or you're taking over a country, what do you think you go after? You go after critical infrastructure because little bit by little bit, this is why I said it's called death by a thousand cuts, little bit by little bit, you start to cut off strategic supply lines and you start to hit people where it hurts most in terms of energy, food and, uh, and communications, right? Look what we saw with AT&T not so long ago. And now we find out all the information from AT&T has been leaked onto the dark web and so on and so on, right? These are small cuts that attack our most critical life support systems that, that every single one of us needs to survive. So they are really food, electricity, communications, you know, I mean, these are things that, you know, if we were to lose all of those all at the same time, if they were to affect some of these attacks or all of them at the same time, they would paralyze the United States. Why do you think the Biden administration is lying about this? Why do you think they're covering this up and so vehemently? And of course, as you pointed out, most news organizations aren't covering the story at all, just talking about some of the economic damage and, you know, how the port won't be able to reopen, but there's really no further journalism happening on this, but it seems like they're just all radio silence. If they, if they wanted to pin this on Russia, you would think that they would be out in force telling us about the great Russian threat. Or if this was China, you think at least some members of the administration would be saying that this was China 
that attacked us here? And first of all, do we know who it is? And why do you think they're being silent on this? Well, this is, you know, obviously a question for the Biden administration, right? I mean, wouldn't it be great if we could actually hear a journalist ask someone from the White House or from the administration, um, <laughs> you know, exactly that question and, and let them answer? And also, Clayton, you know, a lot of people say to me, well, they're never going to answer that. Let the country see them refusing to answer that question hmm. or avoiding answering that question, because that in itself is a response. That in itself is a very important answer. And what we do, when if we don't ever ask these questions of the right people, right, the people who are actually responsible for those decisions, we just allow them to get away with it. So that's very frustrating for me. I'm not in the White House press corps. I'm not standing up there, you know, confronting people on the podium every day. And so, um, so I'm not in a position to ask that publicly, but it would be sure would be great. And there are a few very brave reporters there, like Peter Ducey, right, from Fox News, who does an extraordinary job of standing up day after day when his colleagues basically sit there and betray. I mean, if we took an oath as journalists, they have betrayed it. It is an unspoken oath, right, that our job is to speak truth to power and to find, you know, and to try to find out the, the truth and the whole truth and that we have a healthy degree of skepticism and we don't just take people at their word and so on. And there are big questions here, like, what, what about the insurance? You know, if you, if you, um, insurance is a very important indicator for us in understanding the impact of COVID and the so-called vaccine mandates, right? Um, because if you look at the insurance companies, they, they, their bottom line is there in black and white and in numbers, in cents and dollars. So they're not hiding how many people are dying because these premiums are going up life expectancy is going down and you know and all of these markers that have been sort of pillars of the insurance industry for a very long time are shifting because you've got so many people dying and and so you can go to somewhere like the insurance companies and you can get a very good independent non-political barometer of what the truth is well you know that raises some very important questions here because one you've got the administration leaping forward to say we'll pay for everything doesn't that sound a little bit like you want to keep that company quiet? Right. Wouldn't that be a great question to ask the administration? You know, are you trying to appease the, the, the company? And how come they're not uh, claiming this on their insurance? Because every ship in the ocean, every shipping container has insurance, right? And is covered. Otherwise, they can't function. They can't operate. So I would be very interested in looking as a journalist at what happens, you know, with the insurance company moving forward. As to, you know, what is my analysis based on what I know and what I see of the strategic picture right now and where we are in the country a few months out from what is, you know, arguably the most important election in the history, you know, of this nation. Um, I would say that the, the things that are um, red flags for me are when I have never in all my years as a journalist, which is more than 35 now, I have never seen so many um, disasters in critical infrastructure. You know, one, we had COVID hit the supply lines. That was absolutely catastrophic, not just to this economy, but to economies all over the world that have never recovered. We saw catastrophic damage to the middle class, to small uh, family businesses, to small farms, to family farms, all of these things have never uh, recovered and they've never been addressed. Then when you look at the policies um, that are being implemented, you know, against the climate policies that are being used to shut down uh, farmers and to seize farmlands and to target farm animals and the farming industry and the regulations that have been used to shut down farmers, what you are seeing over time, and remember, death by a thousand cuts, right? Over time, what you are seeing is a massive strategic assault on the food industry, right? There are a lot of things when I go to the grocery store that I used to be able to get very easily before COVID that have never come back to our grocery shelves. They have never, ever come back, right? And people, are, they don't ask why not? There are a lot of things in industry and construction that are much harder now to get or things that are much more expensive. All of these things collectively have led us to a point where we're in, you know, we're really suffering. Americans are really paying the price when they go to the grocery store, when they go to the gas station, when um, if you're in construction or any other industry, right, where your inputs, they've all gone up. No one's talking about it. The petrodollar 
is under assault. I mean, we have an administration that declared war on the en energy industry from the moment they took office. When they put permits, you know, for research and development in government lands, when they put those permits on hold, they sent a message to the oil industry, your, your leases, your contracts with the federal government are not secure. And when you're in the oil industry, which requires a lot of money, it's heavy on research and development investment up front, and the payout comes later, people are not stupid. They're not gonna you know, leverage themselves for millions and millions of dollars knowing that the people who are in power can just take those leases back, cancel them, or suspend them, freeze them indefinitely at any moment. That's gonna cripple you. So when you look at that, and then you look at climate policies you know, that are like the highest um, emission standards for automobiles that are going to basically put gas cars, you know, out of business, right? Nobody's even going to be selling them in a few years. And then you look at, wait a minute, they've used more than 400,000 barrels of our strategic oil reserve. That's more than 60% of our strategic oil reserve. And what are we doing to replenish that? We're not doing anything to replenish that. And then we've got the BRICS nations and the whole financial industry, right? And you've got the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, who are, who are effectively joining with other countries, Saudi Arabia now, Turkey and beyond, that are removing themselves from the petrodollar. So, I mean, if you speak to anyone in finance, they will tell you that if you, the petrodollar collapses, the dollar collapses, and this country is in real trouble. So why do we not hear anyone from the Biden administration talking about that? Why do we have all these fires at food processing plants? Suddenly they're everywhere. And you notice how here's a pattern, because as journalists, we look for patterns, right? As intelligence analysis, we look for patterns. So what do you see? Well, you see one fire and then you see another fire, then another fire and then another fire, right? And so what happens there is each individual fire is explained away and you can get a logical explanation for it and that sounds reasonable but what they don't want you to do is to start to connect these dots right and that's what investigators do maybe maybe the reason the biden administration is going to pay for this and they don't want the to hold the company or the insurance company liable is because they don't want those independent insurance investigators looking into this right? They want to leave it in the hands of the federal government. The NTSB, what do they know about cyber attacks? Absolutely nothing. That is not their field of expertise. They are not, you know, so they are not really the people that you want. If this was a cyber attack, would you want the NTSB to be the, the lead investigator or would you want Cyber Command? Well, if Cyber Command was any good at this, you would want them, right? But, you know, most of the people I speak to, even in cyber and in intelligence, say that we're in real trouble. Our cyber, cyber uh, you know, command capabilities for investigating this are not where they should be. You know, that, that you know, if you really look at what has kept America safe over the years, Clayton, is we have put as much distance as possible between ourselves and our adversaries. We do not want to go back into a First World War, Second World War type of situation where you're talking about 50, 60,000 people dying in one battle. No, we have said, no, no, no. We, we maintain our dominance by something called overmatch, right? So that when you go onto the battlefield, you may have a devastating attack in Iraq or Afghanistan that killed two, three, four, maybe nine, um, maybe 10 soldiers. But do you ever hear of an attack that killed 200 American soldiers in one go? You know, those are the kind of numbers. So we have worked very hard to put as much distance between ourselves and our adversaries. And in order to do that, we have, uh, we have worked, we have poured billions, if not trillions of dollars of taxpayer money over the years into developing advanced capabilities that put us way ahead. What we have been systematically doing since Obama took office, it may have started earlier, but I've been documenting it since Obama's time. We have been systematically reducing that. I have spoken to people at a very high level within Space Command who was, whose orders are, we do not want overmatch in space. We want parity. Why would we want parity, equality, with our adversaries, where we can really be harmed or where we have a real chance of losing, right, on the battlefield? Why would you want that? You know, you, if your goal was to protect the United States and defend this country at all costs and strengthen this nation, 
you would not be doing things that systematically break down this nation's ability to defend itself. You would not, for example, somebody else that I spoke to in Special Operations Command, who was years ago, his job under the Obama administration, he was uh, attached to the State Department in nuclear prolif uh, counter proliferation. He discovered that one of our key counter proliferation systems had been turned off under Obama. The guy that was supposed to be monitoring every incremental change in key strategic areas for nuclear proliferation was playing games on his computer and had been for more than a year. On the orders of his superiors, he had been told to stand down and turn off that monitoring system. Why would you do that if your goal was to protect this country at all costs? You wouldn't. So I'm not going to speculate as to why this administration is doing that. I'm not going to guess at what's in their heads. I'm going to tell you as a journalist that every single indicator I see in every direction tells me that the people in positions of power and authority who are making these decisions have not prioritized the protection of this country, are working to systematically reduce our advantage in every single arena. And for me, the logical conclusion is that they are not the allies and supporters and defenders of this country, but they are the enemies within. Yeah, they're, they're the ones that are c carrying out treason right in front of our eyes. And they're inside the White House. They're inside the halls of Congress right now. Just look at the southern border for crying out loud. And over the past 48 hours, we've had France go on high alert for a terrorist attack. We've had an audio statement released by ICE, uh, by ISIS saying that these attacks are coming to Europe. They're coming to the United States. And if you go on the De Department of Homeland Security's website as of this afternoon, there's no mention of any terror threat in the United States. Is it because they are willingly allowing these individuals to pour right across the United States borders and infiltrate the United States? I mean, I'll get you out of here on this, Laura. What are your cyber intelligence experts telling you and intelligence experts telling you in your own reporting about what they fear is coming for the United States this calendar year in terms of attacks, infrastructure attacks, and more. It was this it? Are we going to see this the last of it? What we just saw in Oklahoma with that barge that hit there? Is that we're done now? We can go back to forgetting about all of these troubles? So I can do better than tell you what they fear, right? What I can tell you is based on what they know. So what they know is that when you um, seek to dismantle a government or take over a country, you systematically break down its critical infrastructure. What are you going to do? What did we see when the US invaded Iraq? We saw them, one of the first things that happens before you have any conventional troops on the ground, your advanced troops are going ahead. And what are they doing? They're taking over airfields. They're taking over oil fields, right? They're taking over um, your communication systems. So now that everything is, everything runs on cyber, even these old analog systems that we have, they have cyber systems overlaid on top of them. So people will try to attack you and say, well, this port's not important because we have other ports. What they don't tell you is those other ports are on a schedule and you now have how many cargo ships that are out at sea that cannot come into that port. And it's kind of like when you take an airplane Right? Everybody knows if you miss your takeoff or landing time and now you've got a circle in the air because they're trying to clear a gate for you. It's not that it's impossible. They find a way to do it. But sometimes it's so hard, you have to go and land at a nearby airport. Right? right? Well, it's exactly like that in these ports. When you come in, it's you're on the clock. You've got to get that cargo off. You've got to follow maritime law. You've got to get you know that ship out of there because the next one is coming in. So it's not just a simple thing of, oh, just redirect these to other ports. Can it be done? Yes. Can you put some of that hazardous materials through the tunnels? Yes, you can do it. But what does it require? A permit, which takes time, which takes money, which takes an escort, which means shutting down the motorway, which means shutting down the tunnel, which means moving it only at night, and so on and so on. So, you know, all of these people, they throw in small amounts of information that are meant to dilute the, the information in front of people so that you cannot see the truth, right? And also in information warfare, what they're doing is increasing 
ambiguity. So it becomes harder and harder. The more information you have coming at you, the more sort of inputs, right? It becomes harder and harder for you to process all these things. Then they'll throw in some things that are blatantly false, like there's explosions and, you know, they'll come up with all kinds of things. Then they have their bots and their, and their operatives who are staged throughout the information environment who are now, um, who have been, say, they have been masquerading as a conservative anon, for example, you know, or a conservative site, maybe, maybe not anon, maybe a site, uh, for some time. And so they've built up a following inside the conservative community. And now they're saying things that are blatantly false. But, oh, wait a minute, that's coming from this, this guy, and I trust this guy. Does that remind you of election night, Clayton, when it was Fox right. News that called Arizona with less than 10% of the vote counted? What did that do to, you know, independents and conservatives in the country? They were like, wait a minute. If this had come from CNN, I wouldn't have believed them. But this is coming from Fox News. So it must be true. Because here you've got a source that you've relied upon for a period of time and appears to you to be coming from the right. Of course, Fox News at that point obviously was no longer run by Roger Ailes and it was no longer what people thought it was. And so what did they do? They've left in droves. Right. And so they, they maintain their cover by keeping people like Tucker Carlson on until it becomes too costly and then they get rid of them. Now, they've got other people that are, you know, very genuine about their reporting that help to restore some of your faith. So these are systematic operations. We have people that are highly trained and specialized in doing exactly this type of attack in foreign countries. Right. Who have been tasked by our own government to do this. So they're speaking from experience. And what they see when they see one systematic critical infrastructure attack after another are what they call, some of them call stacking operations, right? So on the one hand, you're testing those systems and you're seeing exactly how people respond and, um, and you know then how to counter that response. If you want to create maximum effect, one of the things that you'll do is see, okay, so Ohio, how do uh, communities in America respond when they're exposed to toxic chemicals? Can you issue a stay in place order that keeps everybody indoors? Are they going to um, obey that? And how much time do you have? So on the one hand, you've got probing and testing operations that are testing all of your systems. But what is of major concern here to the people who do this for our government or have been trained to do it for our government is that the other thing they're doing at the same time, you can do testing and probing operations at the same time as you're doing stacking operations, which means you are building up your plan, your strategic plan, so that when you do all of these things at the same time, you know exactly how to bring this country to its knees. And that is what, what they are seeing is movement towards a goal. They're not seeing there's a random you know, attack here or a random testing operation over there. They are seeing something that to them is very systematic and organized. And it's very hard for people to piece it together because when they don't want you connecting those dots. You know, our ability to serially process information is impacted by the way we receive information today. And in the cyber realm and in social media, we have, you know, all of these inputs coming to us at once. And that collapses our ability to process information. And that's what they want to do. They're overloading you. They're distracting you with things that really don't matter. They're saying nothing to see here. Move on. Do you remember that from Benghazi? Do you remember that? from how many other incidents that have happened over the years, nothing to see here, move on. We've got this, but what people, you know, what professionals in, in our government and some of them outside of our government, some of them in uh, the industry, the oil industry, what they are seeing is the systematic dismantling of the United States' capabilities in the, one of the most critical strategic areas of energy and infrastructure, and that, suggest to them that there is more, not only more coming, but a much, but a coordinated effort that will bring to bear the knowledge that they have gained and, and all of these different uh, attacks at the same time. And that is, uh, that is of significant amount of concern. And this is not something that I'm just being told. I'm not some special, you know, I'm not getting some special briefing that they're not getting inside the government. Every part of the United States government has who, who should be involved in this has had the ability or been exposed to this information. What they choose to do with it 
is up to them. I, we're not, I'm not in control of that. Not, none of us are. But we can put pressure on them by exposing it. Right. They're being briefed on this. They know about this, and they're hiding it from the American Correct. people. I'll get you out of here on 100%. this, Laura. Are they telling you who is responsible for these thousand cuts? Are they pointing to a state actor? Are they pointing to a group of state actors? Uh, where do you think this is coming from? So this is the critical area that comes with time over an investigation. This is the part where you can identify instantly. You know, if you know that channel and you know, you know, maritime law and you know how that port operates and you know that area, you could see instantly from the video that that ship was not in the channel before it made that turn. You knew that that ship was not gonna make that turn. If you understand science, the speed of the water, the weight of the ship, the weight of the cargo, the speed that the ship was going, the, the, how much room there is or isn't in this case to maneuver at that point, then you knew that that ship was going to crash. And, you, and if you know that bridge as a structural engineer, you knew that hitting it at that point, that anchor point closest to the shore, that's deeper, stronger, thicker than anything else, you knew that was gonna bring down 50% of the span of that bridge. What you cannot say with any certainty without a full investigation, and even, even after a full investigation it will be very challenging, is who is responsible. <clears throat> so what you're going to find, you may have very strong indicators, and it's going to not just rest on the cyber information, right? Because that's where you're going to really struggle. This can be spoofed to make it look like it's coming from Iran or from China or from Russia, from any of the normal suspects but it may not be coming from them. And so it, you are going, your investigators are going to have to piece together many different bits of information to come up with a collective picture in order, and it's going to come from, it's not just going to come from a cyber, from the cyber evidence, because in cyber you can mask your tracks, you can hide anything, and it is the invisible crime. So the people that I'm speaking to, they're very careful to stick to what they know. What they, can, what they can verify, what they can back up, what they know to be true. They don't want to speculate. There are some you know, obvious suspects because when you look at the broader landscape, there are other indicators that point towards someone else um, and there are the usual suspects. But I don't want to say it because the truth is I don't know the answer. Right, and right. I also try to stick to what I know. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And they can mask it and... Wouldn't they love to throw us off the trail of what's really happening? At the end of the day, death by a thousand cuts, they're accomplishing their mission. You know, whether it's wildfires in West Texas wiping out the beef industry, whether it's, uh, yeah. you know, together, whether it's leaking 73,000 Americans' private data information to the dark web via an uh -huh. AT&T hack, whether it's wiping out an electrical grid in, in New York, causing a blackout, whether it's a, a, you know, a terror attack on a bridge that shuts down a port, all of these things add up to the destruction of the United States. And that's ultimately their goal, which is what's happening right now. And it's absolutely terrifying. And, uh, you know, we have to rely on amazing journalists like you to, to be able to put this information out there um, with all of the thousand cuts that you take on a daily basis <laughs> on social media. Um, you know, thank you for being brave. Thank you for joining us for the first time here on this show and continue your great work, Laura. We really appreciate taking some time out to talk with us about this. Well, I appreciate your bravery because you'll be attacked just for having me on your show. And I can tell you, Clayton, I've reached the point now after more than a decade where um, the, the cuts just tickle. They yeah. don't even, they don't even draw blood at this point you know and in fact they're quite amusing because they are a roadmap the cuts are a real indicator i would urge everybody out there in your audience the more you see somebody at being attacked the more important it is for you to take a critical look at what they're saying and the entire situation you never have to take my word for it that's not how journalism is supposed to work you know and it just makes me laugh when i see them going after anonymous sources because you know as if anyone in this day and age Right. As if anyone in this day and age is going to keep their job or have a chance of survival if they come out there and tell you, you know, what they're the truth when everyone in their hierarchy and in their command structure is saying uh, the exact opposite. I mean, give me a break. Right. We see that with whistleblowers, even with whistleblower protection, mm -hmm. they're still getting their lives destroyed, even if they have that protection. So exactly okay. right. Laura Logan, great to have you here on the show. We really appreciate it. We'll let you get back to it. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Clayton. Take care.
Wow. And thank you to Laura for that. We really appreciate it. I, I mean, I, I, I sure hope that you guys were paying attention because there were moments that I said, I, I, I have to go back. I just I want to go back and rewatch what I, what she just said, because there were some very important, critical things that she just said for the future of the United States. And I hope people are paying attention to what she just said. Um, and they don't just focus on the bridge piece of this, because to me, there were so many important takeaways uh, from this interview. Again, I hope I hope you all share this interview with uh, with family and friends out there, because a lot of what she said is vital for the survival of the United States right now uh, and the Western world. You see what's happening in Europe right now as well. So not just about the United States, but our thanks to Laura for joining us here on the show. And thanks to all of you for subscribing. We have a daily newsletter. I would love for you to all subscribe to our daily newsletter. It's totally free. And by the way, you know, it's it's not controlled by big tech. You know, we've been banned and blocked on this channel on on YouTube specifically multiple times. And the only way that we were able to connect connect with people was to be able to send them an email through our newsletter. Um, so please sign up. It's totally free. Not only do you get a great newsletter every day, Monday through Thursday, um, you can read it in about five or 10 minutes and we cover a lot of the big stories of the day. Uh, but it's also a way for us to connect with you. If something were to happen, we're able to let you know, uh, this is what happened to our show. This is what's going on here. Please um, uh, connect with us that way. So in that way, we control it. It's not controlled by any of the big tech companies. So come over to redacted.inc, put in your email address. You'll receive a welcome email from us and then uh, you'll receive the newsletter. Monday through Thursday, about 7 a.m. Eastern time, uh, first thing in the morning over your cup of coffee. So again, redacted.inc. Well, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, we're not going to be here for the next few days. We're taking a few days off for spring break. We kind of worked all through the spring break holiday, but we're going to take two days off with our kids to do just a small little trip as a family uh, before they head back to school. Um, so we're going to be doing that over the next few days. We won't have a live show on Wednesday or Thursday like we normally would. Uh, but we will have, of course, great content for you and great interviews that we already have, have already done that you'll be able to see. But we'll be back here live on Monday uh, here on Redacted. So I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your week. It's hard to say five times fast. Wonderful rest of your week. And uh, we'll be back here on Monday. Have a great night, everyone.